I want you to turn with me real quick to Acts chapter 3. Mm-hmm. She came in on a wheelchair. She oh, yeah. Oh, good deal. Right. Amen. He just told me that there was a person here that was here in a wheelchair last night that just walked in today. <laughs> Amen. Amen. God is good. Amen. Amen. So, well, now I want to take you to Acts chapter 3. I like Acts chapter 3. Of course, I like all of it, but Acts chapter 3 kind of stands out because it kills so many sacred cows. And I want to share something. Now, I will tell you, uh, if you, uh, I, I don't know how we're going to get it to you necessarily, but uh, if you get a chance, you should get this morning's first service and get a copy of it and study it and go through it and go through it and go through it, and we'll figure out a way to get it to you uh, so that you can hear it uh, because you, you need it. You need this morning's uh, message. And so, and, and <clears throat> the Lord has had me move, and it's actually almost two part, it would continue. You'll get it even though you didn't hear the first service, but it's not an identical from the first service, but it's a kind of a tag it on to the end of it, and it would be a, a natural continuation. So in Acts chapter 3, it says in verse 1, Now Peter and John went up together into the temple at the hour of prayer, being the ninth hour. And a certain man, lame from his mother's womb, was carried, whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple, which is called Beautiful to ask alms of them that entered into the temple. So now he was, he was looking for money. He needed money, isn't that right? Amen. And he was crippled from his mother's womb, but he was there and he was always asking for money because he had no hope of healing. So I want you to realize that. He wasn't looking for healing. He wasn't expecting healing. We would say he had no faith for healing. Right? So how do you know that? Because he's still crippled. Okay, that's the first thing, right? And you'll see it in just a minute. Now watch this. And it says, this man, in verse 3, who seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, ask an alms. So he sees these two coming along, and he asks them, hey, help out. Now, he's pretty smart being right outside the temple because people are always generally more generous when they're going into church. <clears throat> so not always in church, but I'm saying going in, they want everybody to see them. So. <laughs> now, watch this. This is vital. Get these details here because he says, in verse 4, and Peter, fastening his eyes upon him. I said, there's no useless idle words in the Bible. Jesus preached against idle words. And so every word in there is to be looked at and analyzed. And it says, and Peter, fastening his eyes upon him. Now notice, this is a key. If you want to be used in healing, you have to be able to fasten your eyes on the person that's in front of you and not be thinking about how many more you got to pray for or how many you just prayed for or what's going on with this person or <clears throat> you know, five people down the row is a person in a wheelchair, so you're going to have to go after that. <clears throat> you can't think that way. You have to be focused on the person that's in front of you. <clears throat> if your mind is still on the person you just prayed for, when you start praying, if you're thinking about them, what you're praying will go to them, and the person in front of you won't even touch them. And so you have to be able to shift. You have to be able to, now listen carefully, you have to be able to attach to that person, and when you're done... You step to the next person and you <laughs> detach from that person and you attach to this person. So each, it, it doesn't matter how many people are in the line, each person is a person that you have to be there at that moment. So Peter, fastening his eyes upon him with John, said, look on us. Now I'm just going to start pointing out some of these things here. Notice Peter has already made a mistake. He said, look on us. Now, we all know. We've all, you know, it's been raised in church. You know better than to tell somebody to look at you. Amen. What do you say? Look to Jesus. Hmm. But that isn't what Peter said. Peter said, look right here. Look on us. And see, Peter, poor Peter, he just met, he doesn't know theology. <laughs> you know? <clears throat> he was just so deprived of a, a good theological education. I mean, he, he was just a fisherman that had just spent at least three years with Jesus, but he didn't know better. Or maybe he did. 
because we're going to find out his theology worked, and a lot of times modern theology doesn't. So he says here, and he gave, now watch this. He said, look on us, and he gave heed unto them, expecting to receive something of them. Yeah, money. Remember, he, he was not thinking about healing. Then Peter said, silver and gold have I none. Now that proves he was Pentecostal. <coughs> Okay, so just, but now he couldn't say that a couple of days later, because a couple of days later, they came and piled money up at his feet, gold and silver and all that kind of stuff at the apostles' feet, and then they distributed it. Notice they didn't get rich off of it, they distributed it, and helped the people that were hungry and helped the people that had need. So, he said, silver and gold have I none, but, just like pastor said just a minute ago, such as I have, give I thee. Now, first off, before Peter could say, such as I have, give I thee, he had to know he had something that he could give. Notice this is his second mistake. He said, what I got, I give you. He didn't say, let's pray and see what the Lord will do. He didn't do that. He said, what I got, I give you. Why? Because just a few days before this, Jesus has said that you will receive power after that the Holy Ghost will come upon you. And he told them, he said, you go into all the world, you make disciples, and he said, and you heal the sick, and raise the dead, cast out devils, lay hands on them. Oh, you do all this stuff. And he told him, do what I told you to do. So he knew what to do. And he knew he had something to give them. Now watch what he says. He says, silver and gold have I none, but such as I have, give I thee. Then he gives it in the name. He had that name. He had the name. He had the power. See, the name gives you authority. The power gives you ability. And so you have to realize that devils have ability, but they don't have authority. Jesus has authority, and that because he does, you do. You understand that? And he says, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. He didn't say, well, now just I hope you get better. He told him to do something he could not do. Notice this, this, these steps. He said, well, I'm not going to give you money. <clears throat> I don't have any money to give you. I'm not doing that. I'm giving you something better. I'm giving you something, what I've got. I'm giving it to you. So in the name of Jesus, rise up and walk. Now watch this. This is, I thought was kind of interesting too, because he said in verse 7, and he took him by the right hand. So now he's laying hands. He's touching him. That's all it means. But he took him by the right hand and lifted him up. Peter lifted the guy. He told him to rise and walk. And apparently the man moved too slow. So Peter takes him by the hand and lifts him up. And immediately, his feet and ankle bones received strength. Immediately, whenever he lifted him up. If he hadn't lifted him up, he wouldn't have been healed. At least not that quick. If the man had tried to get up, that would have been different maybe. But notice here that immediately, now in many ways, now notice, I want you to understand everything falls under the name of Jesus. Everything is under that umbrella. But even though it's under that umbrella, you still got to do something. You have to do something. You got the name. You use the name. The name affects the, the results. But you have to do something sometimes. Now, understand, you've got different aspects. And we're not really going to go into depth on the gifts of the Spirit this morning. But I want you to realize that in the gifts, the gifts cover every aspect of human need. All those, just Even just the nine gifts in 1 Corinthians covers everything a human can need. Now, the gift of prophecy in itself has nothing to do with telling the future. The gift of prophecy has to do with edification and comfort. It has to do with exhorting. It doesn't have anything to do with the future, which is kind of strange because we always talk about prophecies getting filled, you know, fulfilled and that kind of stuff. But it really isn't that. I mean, it's, we can see these prophecies set forth, but that prophecy... The gift of prophecy is different. The gift of prophecy is, and Dr. Summer used to tell us, there's two gifts you've got to get if you're going to be um, in pastoral leadership or something like that. There's two gifts you've got to operate in. He said one is the gift of prophecy and the other is the discerning of spirits. Now there's others you can function in. He said, but you've got to have those two. Why? Because the gift of prophecy is to exhort, to edify, and to comfort. You need that for the sheep. You need that for the congregation. You need to be able to exhort you need to be able to 
edify and build up, and you need to be able to comfort. And so you need that gift in operation regularly, fluently, we would say. And then you need the gift of discerning of spirits. Why? Because you also have to guard the sheep. And you have to know who comes in. You have to know those that labor among you. You have to be able to discern their spirit, whether their spirit is of God or not of God. Because, you know, <clears throat> angels of light, ministers of Satan, uh, you know, wolves, false prophets, they don't walk in announcing, hello, I'm a wolf. <laughs> they don't do that. They come in looking good. They come in and, you know, they got it all together and they do everything that makes people like them and they do all this stuff. They see... Wolves seldom, say, okay, <laughs> wolves, make a note, write this down, wolves will hardly ever make you mad. Why? Because if, if they make you mad, you won't give. And that's why they're there, is to get, to get you to give. This is just like, almost like being a hireling, it's the other end of being a hireling. A hireling is only there for what they can get paid for. But a wolf comes in to get from you, to destroy, to cause chaos or confusion, or just to stir up trouble. Even, even if they can't destroy you, they, they try to create just enough problems so that, you, so that the vision that God has given you will not be truly fulfilled because you're too busy stamping out fires. And so, <clears throat> then, I don't know why I got off on that there. But anyway, it's true. It's true regardless. But, well, it's talking about the discerning of spirits. But now there's all the other gifts that are there also, and there's the gift of faith. Now, you can see the gift of faith, and you can see it in the, in the New Testament, but even a, a good example of the Old Testament is when Moses stood at the Red Sea and essentially just said, stand still and see the salvation of God. See, faith, there's works of faith, obviously, and you do works of faith, but faith will speak and watch it, watch the thing occur, right? Faith, the gift of faith in operation, okay, usually doesn't have to do anything. Now, if, if it requires doing something to get a gift in operation, that is usually the gift of the working of miracles. There's no such thing as a gift of miracles. There's the gift of the working of miracles. The working of miracles means you've got to do something to work it. Right? It doesn't just happen. That would be the gift of faith. The working of miracles means you do something. Because of it. Right here we would say Peter was possibly operating in the working of miracles. Why? Because the man wasn't moving. He had decreed by faith what the man should do. And then he took him by the right hand and he had to do something and he lifted the man. That was the working. And as soon as he did that, notice it wasn't the man that did it. It was Peter that did it. Why? Because Peter had the gift. What gift? Did he have the gift of the working of miracles? Yes, but no. He had the gift of the Holy Spirit. And the gift of the working of miracles is in the Holy Spirit. So if you have the Holy Spirit, the potential to operate in all nine gifts is there. Amen. Now, based on, and, and you know, this may sound kind of strange, but based on your personality, on your temperament, and maybe even what you've been taught, you will tend to move toward particular gifts. Now, one of the things that we did a while back actually some time back now, is that we did an experiment and we put up signs around the church for different gifts and didn't say anything about them. And then we just told people, go stand in front of one of the signs. And it was amazing. People would go to all these different signs and then you go talk to them, you find out, obviously they were drawn to whatever that sign was and then you talk to them a little bit more and you'll find out that they were actually already operating in those gifts and didn't even, they thought they wanted the gift but they were already operating in the gift. Especially word of knowledge, word of wisdom, things like that. Because everybody thinks that for a word of knowledge or a word of wisdom to be given, you have to say, thus saith the Lord, and then proclaim something. And the word of knowledge and especially the word of wisdom, honestly, is hardly ever like that. I mean, it can be, but it's not, not often. Usually the word of wisdom comes out by the Holy Spirit. And now you have to understand the word of wisdom, say, as I said before, the gift of prophecy has nothing to do with the future. <clears throat> the word of wisdom has to do with the future. It's a, it's a word. It's not all of God's word. It's a word from God of wisdom telling a person what they should do 
or what is going to happen and how for them to deal with it. And so it has that deals with the future. The word of knowledge is a word of now. Yeah, in other words, they have to, God has to tell you something that is knowledge. It's a, it's a fact. Uh, it is, this has happened. You know, um, <clears throat> go your way. Your, your daughter's healed. Things like that. It's just like that's done. It was done there, and that would be a word of knowledge. This is done. And so it's, but it's something that no human could know. It's something that, it's not something you could even figure out on your own with just basic information available. It is a word from God of right now what has just happened or is happening right now. But the gift of the word of wisdom is something future and it helps you in your future. And so many times when people ask for a word, they think they're asking for like a word of knowledge or a prophecy. And in actuality, they're really looking for a word of wisdom. And so these are how these gifts work. Now, the reason you know, I know about these things is because, again, I spent years with Dr. Lester Summerall, who was the acknowledged expert when it came to the gifts of the Spirit. And he was acknowledged by that by pretty much everybody, all kinds of groups and everything else, and he would teach on it. And his, his main areas of uh, expertise was gifts of the Spirit, faith, and demons and deliverance. And so those were the main things that we learned about while we were there and what we constantly heard drill. Now, I will admit, you know, to a man with a hammer, every problem looks like a nail. All right? But now you think about it because a person, you can take any one of the nine gifts and meet the need of the person standing in front of you. See, it doesn't have to be, oh, well, what you need is a word of knowledge, so go down there to so-and-so because they, they operate in a word of knowledge. I don't operate in a word of knowledge. Uh, I operate more in this. But almost any of the nine gifts can function in a way that will help the person where they are. And so it all depends. Now, if you went to an A.A. A. Allen meeting, uh, at some point, if you're going to go up and be ministered to, at some point, you're going to be yanked on or something because if you're in a wheelchair, he's going to grab you and pull you out of that wheelchair. If you're in a, on a stretcher, and I've got videos of all this, if you're on a stretcher, he's going to, and they usually have him covered with a blanket, and it's so funny to watch him because he was real energetic, and, you know, he's just pretty dramatic, right? And they'd bring the person up with the stretch on the stretcher, and they'd be covered with a sheet, and he would say, well, do, are they dressed underneath the sheet? Yep, they're dressed, all right? And then he would tell the people, all right, believe with me, believe. He was one of the first people to actually use what is now called the corporate anointing or corporate faith, we could even say. And so he would just, he'd get ready, he'd believe with me, and we believe, and then he would command for them to be healed. And then, it was, you ever see those bullfighters that take the red, you know, and, and he's doing this kind of stuff, and how they do all the fancy stuff in between? That's kind of what Alan did, because the person would come up, and he would take that sheet. He didn't just pull it off. He did something dramatic with it. <laughs> and that thing's all over, and, he, and then he throws it aside, and then he grabs a hold of this person and says, be healed. And then he grabs them and just yanks them right off the stretcher. And then when they land on their feet, they're healed. What? And I see that's the working of miracles. That wasn't just faith. But that was the working of miracles because he did something to get them up. If you went to a Jack Coe, Jack Coe was very similar. As, well, they called Jack Coe a man of reckless faith and because of how he did things. Now, Jack Coe, um, okay, I have... I've been so extremely blessed in, in my Christian life. Spent time with Dr. Summerall. Uh, before I was even in full-time ministry, uh, we, my family lived in Longview, Texas, and um, there was the, um, the revival center there that was actually founded by Jack Coe. And when I went there, his son, Steve Coe, uh, he had two sons, Steve and Jack Jr., and Steve Coe pastored the church when I was there. And so, and his mother... Uh, was also there. And so while I was there, I was able to get a hold of a bunch of cassette tapes and VHS and all kinds of stuff of Jack Coe meetings. So I got all these things. And I got them from them, started watching them. And then <clears throat> Steve Coe, and then I got, after that, I got to, uh, I got invited up to speak at a church in Wisconsin, uh, Wisconsin, Milwaukee, no? Madison, Wisconsin, yeah. And uh, there, it was at a conference with, um, Don Gossett, if you don't know who that is, he's really big on words, worked with Edith B. Kenyon. And so I met Don Gossett there and got to talk with him. But that's where I met Jack Coe Jr. And so we formed a friendship, and I stayed in touch with him until he passed away uh, several years ago because he lived just outside of Dallas. And so I had all these, these intersections of, of 
men of God that I was able, I couldn't get to the man himself usually, but I got a hold of their families and God just orchestrated it. And so it was, it was really, it's, it's amazing to go back and look at. Well, so I'm watching this. Jack Coe was a, was a big man. And he, people would come. And see, it's funny because everybody thinks that the, uh, you know, <laughs> that the gangsters invented bling. <laughs> they didn't. They didn't. It was Pentecostal preachers. <laughs> yeah, you go back and watch these guys, right? You, you see these? These are really convenient, these little, little microphones. They didn't have that then. Jack Coe would take those, you know, those big mics, you know, on the stand, the, the, the big microphones, and they would detach them and hang them around his neck. <laughs> and so he was walking around with this big old bling hanging around his neck so he could still preach and talk and people could hear him. And he would have this, and I had this on video with this little woman come up this time, and she was like, you know, she just walks up there, you know, real, real sweet and gentle. And he says, and he had this big old voice, and he'd say, Mama, what's wrong with you? And he said, well, well I just got a back problem right here. He goes, all right, then. He'd just reach up and grab her by the head. <laughs> down, up, down, up, down, up. And I'm watching, and, she, and he's got his hands on her head, and she goes down. Every time she comes up, she's like, Right back down. I mean, like, like she was saying, please, somebody help me. Help me. And he's just. Rah, 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 rah. And then finally he turns loose over and he goes, how's that? And she goes, I'm healed. I'm healed. And he goes, I thought so. And, and, he's, a, and he's a big old boy. So he would just, he was reckless. He would just do all kinds of crazy stuff, you know. <clears throat> And, I mean, you could go on and on with the different stories. But Alan had his personality, kind of very theatric. Coe wasn't theatric, but he was very serious about what he did, and he was very reckless in his faith, and he would just do stuff. He wasn't trying to be theatrical. Alan was a little more, you know, performer-based. I'll just be honest with you. I mean, he, he believed it, but he did things he didn't have to do. Jack Coe just pretty much did what he needed to do. Then you had people like William Branham. And then William Branham, he was just quiet, very soft-spoken. Dr. S he, he actually lived up near Dr. Summerall, and um, Dr. Summerall met him several times. And Dr. Summerall said the two most humble people he ever met, he knew them and they ministered for him and, and uh, he interviewed them. And he said the two most humble men of God he ever met, one was Billy Graham and the other was William Branham. And so... He said they're both there, and William Brown was just very soft-spoken, and, and he was just, yes, yes, we're, you know, we're just waiting on the presence of the Lord, and, and he was just, I mean, just so soft-spoken, very dull, very boring, okay? <laughs> and the amazing thing was is it was his gift that was amazing because he would try to teach. He loved teaching, and he would teach, and he would bring in history, but he wasn't good at it. And he would talk about history, and he'd have Hitler fighting Napoleon. I mean, his history was just messed up, you know. And Gordon Lindsay, that started Christ of the Nations, told him one time, said, listen, don't teach. Just use the gift, right? He said, the people come to see the gift and be ministered to by the gift. They don't come to hear you preach. Why? Because you can't, right? And, and William Branham told me, he said, but I like it. He goes, but you're not good at it. He said, stay in your lane. I mean, he used different terms, but, you know, find your, find your groove and get there, you know, and stay there. Now, Dr. Summerall used to always tell us, he said, find where your anointing flows and stay there. Get in there. He said, now, if you stretch and it keeps flowing, keep stretching. And then you'll stretch from one thing kind of over into the other. He said, but if you stretch and it, and it stops working, go back to what you were doing. And so he said, help the people. But find, find where the anointing flows and stay there is basically what he used to tell us. Now, so, but William Brandon would just be talking softly. And he'd say, and his, he was amazed. His gift, the, the gift of the word of knowledge, phenomenal. Gordon Lindsay said in thousands of times that he saw William Branham function in that gift all over the world because they traveled together all over Sweden, Finland, South Africa, everywhere. He said 
I, I saw him minister the gift thousands of times, and he never missed one detail. Not once. And he would give details. And, and I have him on video where he's there and this woman, and they, they would take numbers, and they, he would call numbers, and they would come up, and they would come up to him, and he'd say, all right, yep. Uh, and he said, I'm just waiting on the press. Okay, there he is. Okay. And he would say, now, do I, do I know you? Have we ever met? And no, no. And it would be this a little late with this particular incident. This woman said, no, we've never met. All right. Because he, he was just saying that for the audience benefit. And he said, okay. Um, now, you live at 1523 West Indiana Avenue uh, a, 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 up in Indianapolis. And you drove down here yesterday with your husband. Now, you, when you came down, you were in a, it was a black 49 Plymouth. And you were in the back seat. Your husband was driving, but you were in the back seat, and you had, you, you had on the same red hat you got now, but your husband now, and the woman would be sitting, she, she was sitting over there before she got up here, and he'd say, now your husband, and he'd look where she was sitting, he goes, uh, what's he doing over there? Because he's sitting over there. And so he said, and because the man couldn't get back up the front is what it was, but he, but he knew who they were. He said, now, uh, and he, he said, now you were, you were, I'm going to be in Houston in a couple of weeks, and you were going to come to Houston, but your sister wrote you a letter and said, don't go to Houston, come to this meeting because it's closer. I mean, just all this stuff. you know. And, and the funny thing is, he's just talking, calm, peaceful, and this woman over here, as soon as he starts, he, she's like, <laughs> you know, and he said, now, is, is that true? Is that true? <laughs> this is true? And he said, well, then if the Lord knows that about you, then he knows about the, the disease. He knows about the cancer you've had, and he knows that it's inoperable. And so, and if he knows about that about you and tells you that, then he's not going to let you die from it. So he's healing you. So you're healed. Go your way. And the woman goes, <laughs> and just walk off crying. But that's, now see, he was totally different, but yet same results. Same results. Why? Because of personality, because of how he tapped in the Spirit, how he allowed the Spirit. But now notice the thing is, he was always that way. So when the Spirit came into him, the Spirit, it, it didn't change his personality per se. The personality blended. Okay, if you look at terminology in the Bible, and this sounds a little more like a Bible school class, but when it talks about the baptism of the Spirit and the Spirit of God coming into you, the terminology used is the same terminology in Greek, in, in the uh, current, or the Greek at the time in some of the books, was how you would take a cloth and you would immerse it into a color, a dye and that the color in the dye would come into the cloth. It wasn't like you took a cloth and painted it. It was a dye that went into the fibers and changed and, and dyed the fibers themselves. So what does that mean? See, the, see, we have this idea. We have an old covenant mindset that the Holy Spirit at times comes upon us like someone would take a sheet and drop it over us. That's not how he comes. He, now understand, it's not that he comes upon. He comes within. Now, he comes upon to get within. But then he gets within, and when he gets within, now what happens is he and you become one. And you get dyed. Okay. Uh, what is that? An antonym? Senate, whatever. Same word, different meaning. <laughs> okay. So, but to have him do that, you have to die. But if you die, he will come upon you, come within you, and you get died. All right? And so what he does is he, he, he permeates every cell. And see, I, I'll give you a little bit more about that in just a minute because that, that means that every part of you becomes completely just saturated with him. That's, that's literally what it means. To saturate the cloth, you put it in the dye until the dye saturates the cloth. And then you pull it out, and now the cloth is dyed. You, and you can never really separate that because it becomes part of the fibers themselves. And if you do something to get it out, like use bleach, you actually destroy the fibers to a degree to get it out. 
And so when the Holy Spirit comes in you, you become one with him. And so it doesn't come upon in the sense of bing, oh, here we go. No, it's in there, and now he comes out. Why? Because out of your belly will flow rivers of living water, rivers of prophecy, rivers of words of knowledge, rivers of words of wisdom, rivers of faith. All that stuff comes out of you because you're one with him. <clears throat> Jesus said, I and the Father are one. And then he prayed and he said, Father, that they may be one as we are one. When, if you remember, whenever Paul uh, was going to Damascus, well, Saul, when he was going to Damascus to make havoc of the church, Jesus stopped him. And when he stopped him, and listen, that day, that persecution was going to stop one way or another. Paul, Saul, was smart and chose the right way. But when he showed up, he saw the bright light. He heard that voice, and he fell down. And the first thing he said is, well, I actually heard Jesus. And Jesus said, Saul, Saul, it is hard for you to kick against the pricks. In other words, why are you doing it? You're just hurting yourself. That's all he was saying. You're just hurting yourself. You're not, you're not hurting the church. You're just hurting yourself. And he said, and then he said, why do you persecute me? But Paul, Saul, didn't know Jesus. We don't even know if he was ever, you know, ever saw him or anything else, technically. But, but Jesus said, why do you persecute me? And Saul said, Lord, who are you? I'm persecuted. How am, how am I persecuted? Who are you? But notice he was smart enough to call him Lord. Why? Because he'd already knocked him down and blinded him and everything. Else. Okay, I don't care who you are. You're Lord. You're it. I get it. Okay? Don't do anything else. Right? And then Jesus says, I'm Jesus, whom you persecute. He didn't say, I'm Jesus, and you're persecuting my church. He said, I'm Jesus, whom you persecute. He said, why do you persecute me? Why? Because Jesus said, listen, if they do this to you, they're not doing it to you. They're doing it to me. Why? How does that mean? See, we think that, oh, isn't that sweet? He loves us. No, no, no. Union. You're connected to him. His spirit in you saturates you and you become one and it's, it's basically impossible to separate. And that's how it should be. It should be impossible to separate you from him. Was that you or is that the Holy Ghost? Yes. Because <laughs> you have to realize that he wants us to be of the same mind. Paul said over and over again, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. To do what? To be a servant. To serve one another. Let this mind be in you. And then he says, guess what? You know why this mind's in you? Because we have the mind of Christ, 1 Corinthians 2.16. We have that mind. We just don't access it. See, years ago, I did what pretty much everybody else does, and I'd lose something, misplace it, put it somewhere, couldn't find it, and I'd just stop and think, well, you know, God knows where it's at. So, Holy Spirit, tell me where it's at. You know it. Tell me where it's at, please. Thank you, in Jesus' name. And then... I'd wait to hear, get direction or something, and then I'd go, and yeah, I'd be there, and it was good. But then as I was studying and moving into these things, and, and I, I realized the principles of God are the same in everything. And so I started looking at that, and I started reading about how we have the mind of Christ. Let this mind be in you. Think on these things. Why? Because that's what Jesus thought on. Things that are good, pure, holy, and good report. All these things, things that are virtuous. And so I started doing these things. And as I was looking at that, then I said, you know what? And that misplaced some things, couldn't find it. And I said, you know what? I didn't even ask the Holy Spirit for it. I said, he says I have the mind of Christ. G in Jesus are hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Wisdom and knowledge. Knowledge to know and the wisdom to know what to do with what you know. And in him are hid all these treasures of wisdom and knowledge. So there's nothing that Jesus didn't know. So I knew he knew where I had placed these things. So I didn't even ask the Holy Spirit to show me. What I did was I got up and I decided I had the mind of Christ. So I choose to access that wisdom and knowledge. And you know what I did? I started walking. And as I walked, yes, I walked around and made some turns and stuff. You know, because I didn't just get up and walk right to it the first time. But I kind of like, okay, and, and I didn't even think about what I was doing. And then when I stopped, there it was. Why? Because I accessed his mind, which is in me. And then from then on, I started doing it. And it got better and better and better and stronger. And then I would just get, if I needed something, 
And listen, I've got roughly 6,000 books in my library. Okay? Shelves and shelves and shelves and shelves. Now, if I am not deciding to access the mind of Christ, then I usually end up having to ask one of my staff, hey, help me find this book, help me find this book. And, you know, but then whenever I decided to start accessing the mind of Christ, I, I decide what book I need, and I get up, and we've moved my office a couple of times now, so all the books are in different places all the time. And I just get up, and I walk in there, and I walk right to it, and there it is, and I take it down and go on. Why? Because I'm accessing the mind of Christ. Why? Because he knows everything. Do you get that? So that this is how Jesus knew where to go whenever he was on this earth. You ever notice he always, now you can go anywhere and walk and find sick people. But he knew and people would, he would walk where people needed help. And I'm not going to say necessarily always need help the most, but who knows? But having that mind of Christ in you, in him. See, what I'm talking about is what you've got. You have him, you have the Holy Spirit, you have his word, you have his mind, you have his power, Holy Spirit, power c comes upon you after the Holy Ghost comes upon you. So you've got all this stuff. The problem is we've been trained in how not to use it. We've been trained in, and, and we think, well, it has to be this way, it has to be that way, it can't be this way. And we think, uh, thus saith the Lord has to be in church, usually right after worship. And we have this idea that, no, these gifts, you have to remember what we have as church today wasn't church first century. It was a totally different thing. They met in houses, but they were out, and what you read in the New Testament, a whole lot of stuff happened outside as they went. You know, in, in businesses and things like, like that, and that's how it should be. Why? Because that's kingdom. See, if you want just church, then you got to have the religious trappings. You know, church as we know it. But if you want kingdom, that affects everything. That, that changes everything. And so you start, and then you say, well, yeah, we want that. But guess what? The kingdom of God is within you. That's what he said. So I don't have to wait for it. It's in there. I have to access it. I have to learn the principles of the kingdom. And the principles of the kingdom mean I have to learn how to operate in the kingdom the way the kingdom is operated. The, there's two different ways to talk. You'll notice God talked about, or in the, in the New Testament, Jesus uh, talked about the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of God. And if you do research on it, you'll find out that technically... Those are two different things. That one is, now, strangely enough, you would think this, that the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God is in the kingdom of heaven. Okay? In Matthew, it's always called the kingdom of heaven. So you have the overarching kingdom of heaven, which includes the kingdom of God, but then you also have the kingdom of God, which does not necessarily include the kingdom of heaven. See? I can, I, I'm an American, but I'm a Texan. See, all, okay, all Texans technically are Americans, but not all Americans are Texans. I'm sorry. Anyway. <laughs> we always say, never ask a man where he's from or if he's from Texas. If he is, he'll tell you. So, and if he's not, you don't want to embarrass him. Anyway, so. <laughs> hey, I come, I have history. My, my wife's sixth great-grandfather was Sam Houston. So we, we've got history there. Now, in my background, I mean, I was born and raised in Texas, but my background, my grandmother was, her name was Rose Hatfield of the Virginia Hatfields. And uh, she was the daughter, of, or, yeah, the, grand, the granddaughter, your daughter? Granddaughter. Uh, no, yeah, daughter, I think it was, of um, John Z. Hatfield that married the McCoy girl. And so... You got these two. I mean, I got Hatfields and McCoy. That's, that's the answer to the internal struggle I have. Hatfields against McCoy. No, yeah. no, no. But again, I don't know how I got off on that. But anyway, okay. But if you go back to how these gifts work, because see, the point is, is that you have this in you. But we have this idea because, as I was saying, even about the, the kingdoms, because Matthew always referred to the, to the kingdom of heaven. He never referred to the kingdom of God. But in the other gospels, it's referred to the kingdom of God. And so you can see how they fit, but they, there is a separation. Because one says that the kingdom of God will never be taken away from you. But it says there are some in the kingdom of heaven, and the kingdom of heaven will be taken away from them. 
So the kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven can't be the same thing because one can't be taken away and one can be. Just something to think about, right? Search it out. And so now, but the kingdom of God, okay, because there's a place and then there's operations, okay? America has a system of operations. In other words, it's how we do things. You go to England, they do things different. They, they drive on the wrong side of the road, okay? You say, why is it the wrong side? Because we drive on the right side. <laughs> there you go. That's how, that's how you know that. And so, but there's differences, amen? And every country has their way of doing things. And you have to, if you go to that country, you have to learn how to operate in their system. Well, the, the kingdom of God has a system. And when Jesus gave the kingdom parables, it wasn't about a place. It was about a way of doing things. The kingdom of God is as a man that sows seed. That's not a place. He sows seed. That's a, that's a system. That's an operation. That's the, this is how the kingdom operates. So if you want to operate, see, you already done this. When you got born again, you did this. The kingdom, the sower sows the word. The word is a seed. The seed that you were uh, saved by was, is incorruptible seed. Can't, you, it won't rot, right? And you've got this incorruptible seed, and the, some sower sowed seed in the soil of your heart, and it produced 30, 60, 100 fold. That's what it was. Now, that's one aspect of it. Now, there's other aspects. You can sow finances and reap 30, 60, 100 fold. You can sow healing and reap 30, 60. It's all just differences, but it's a way of functioning. So the kingdom in that sense. Now, I'm not saying there's not a place. There is a place. But I'm saying that the operation we're in right now is the kingdom of God, you would say, in, or we could even say the kingdom of heaven in that sense, in that it's a kingdom of profession. Okay? In other words, we are professing, we have to live by faith, and we're doing this, and as we live by faith, we are showing our profession that we believe God and we believe his word, and we are by faith living in that kingdom. Now, there will come a time in the consummation of everything where we won't have to do that by faith. Why? Because the reality will be there. See, right now we have to believe in healing by faith. There will come a time when you won't have to believe in healing by faith. Why? Because your body will be changed. Mortality put on immortality, which means what can die won't be able to die. So now when that happens, you're not going to have to live in faith for divine healing. You won't have to worry about it. Nothing can attack you that could kill you. Does that make sense? So these, this kingdom is operating, and God wants us to operate in the kingdom now. See, now it's by profession which shows faith in him and that we trust him, but we know that there will be a consummation of it where we don't have to. Now, but if you operate in the kingdom principles, which all of the parables of Jesus about the kingdom, he went over and over again, the kingdom of heaven is like this, the kingdom of God is like this, this is how the kingdom operates, and they're all principles in how to function. That's why he said, he that endures to the end shall be saved. See, this answers the question of when saved, always saved, can you lose your salvation, that kind of stuff. Why? Because we're in the profession now. You get it? And if we endure to the end, we shall be saved. I have been saved, I'm being saved, and I shall be saved. Does that make sense? And so you're walking this out. But at any time, you could decide to quit. Why? Because there are those that draw back. There are those that depart. The Bible says in the last days there are going to be people who depart from the faith. So there is the ability to depart. But Jesus said if you don't depart, if you endure. So the key is keep going. Don't stop. Amen? I remember one preacher one time said, well, <laughs> hey, we had a good time with this guy. He was something else. And he would stand up and he'd say, you know what? And the question, he started his sermon. It was so simple. He said, what in hell do you want? And everybody's like, what did he just say? And he repeated it. And then he said, let me explain. What is it in hell that you want so bad that you're trying so hard to get there? I'm like, oh, okay, okay, I get it now. Because that didn't way it sounded, you know. <laughs> I thought you just got there and started cussing, you know. And so, but that's what he said. And then there were others, uh, what, I think uh, Richard Roberts at one time, Jesse DePlanis at one time, wrote books that, uh, you know, basically said, if you're going through hell, don't stop. What? Go through. 
listen, if you stop, it ain't going to stop. It's going to keep being bad. So if you're going through it, go through it. Get out the other side. Amen? Don't slow down. Don't look around and worry and get all caught up in stuff. Man, run faster. Don't, you don't change what you're doing unless you're going to speed up what you're doing. Amen? Because remember, the favorite verse in the Bible always says, it came to pass. Why? That means it came to pass. Amen? I know it doesn't mean that literally. But at some point, whatever comes has to pass unless you camp there. Now, the problem is many times traditional church history, they've tried to get us to camp there. You know? Oh, you just got to be there. And, and if you're being afflicted, just, you know, just thank God that he considers you worthy. No. Worthy of persecution, maybe, but not sickness and disease and the things that Jesus went to the cross and went to the whipping post to get rid of. See, those are things we never have to suffer. Now, you might have to suffer people. Jesus suffered people. Jesus said, how long do I have to suffer you? And if you're a pastor, you know that's some of the worst suffering right there. That's just, but, but he said, how long do I have to? So you have to suffer people sometimes. Well, you might have to suffer persecution. The sickness and disease and lack and that kind of, no, you never have to suffer that in, in that sense. Now, now, you can choose to, to suffer lack, meaning that you decide to advance the gospel and you go somewhere and things are kind of rough and it's not as nice as where you live and all that kind of stuff. And you okay, I get some of that. But let me tell you, if you decide to stay there, you'll prosper there. Why? Because you take the kingdom with you. And the kingdom is not dependent on the economy or the circumstances of the area. Now, you have to understand what prospering is. You know, in some places, prospering is having two goats right. instead of just one, right? So, you know, all prosperity doesn't look the same. It kind of, it's kind of relative to where you're at many times, but you can prosper wherever you are. Why? Because God said that. Amen? He said his blessings are upon you. Last night, many times, I was telling you, life, be healed, head to toe, be healed. Many times, I would just stop and say, blessed, blessed. Why? Blessed encompasses everything God has. I could say be healed, that's in blessing. Why? Deuteronomy 28, 1 through 14, shows us that the blessing of the Lord is what? To be free from sickness or disease. So you say blessed, you know, you've said it all when you say blessed. And, but people don't understand that. Sometimes they go, no, 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 but I've got a, I got a sickness or something. I need healing on this. Yep, blessed. If you're blessed, you're healed of your sickness. And so, and, and then I'll stop and say, look, I know my job. Let me do it. Okay? Whatever you've been doing, it ain't working. So let me do what I do because I know it works. Amen? And, but people want it a certain way sometimes. Now, but I want you to see this because here, get back to Acts here, because here Peter is walking in what he knows he's got. That's really why I brought all that out. You have to know what you've got. And you have to know that if you've got it, you can use it. Amen? Yeah, he didn't give it to you to do it. Listen, I, man. We could go into some parables. Remember the parable where Jesus said a man went out early in the morning, went to the marketplace, and everybody's standing around, nobody's working? And he said, why aren't you working? And they said, nobody hired us. And he said, well, go to work. I'll, I'll hire you. And he hired them. And then he waited a while, and he went back out there. A little bit later on, around noon, he goes back out, and there's more people standing there. And he said, what are you doing standing there? Nobody's hired us. Well, go to work. So he hired them. And then he did it again in the afternoon. And then finally, at the end of the day, and he told them, I'll pay you this much money. And at the end of the day, they all came back together. And the ones that were hired in the morning got mad at the ones, at the, at the owner, actually, uh, and because he paid the same amount to the people that worked from the morning as he did the people that got hired in the afternoon. And they got all upset about it. Well, we work longer. We should get more. No, no, no. I made an agreement with you. This is what I'd pay you. And I made an agreement with them. What I do with my money is my business. So it's none of your business. But now, and see, people read that, and it's, and it's, it's an amazing parable. But look at some of the details of it. Because first off, the first thing to notice is every time the owner looked around and saw people standing around, he put them to work. He didn't tell anybody, no, nope, you're not called to do anything. Just go to church, pay your tithes. He never said that. Everybody was out there, he hired them. He hired everybody. Everybody's got a job. Everybody should be busy. Everybody should occupy till he comes. Amen? 
that was a, one of the first things. Second thing is what he was talking about, he gave them all the same thing, which was basically all eternal life is what he was referring to. But he noticed too, he didn't say, well, you, you're worthy to be hired, but you're not. He hired them all. And then, but now notice in the other parables, he said to one he gave five and one he gave ten and one he gave one and all this stuff. And now notice the amazing thing was at the end when he, when he comes back, because you remember when he comes back, he's looking for profit off of what he's put in you. He's given you gifts, understandings. He's given you things, and he's looking for that to be profited. And he, one guy says, oh, look, you know, he said, I, I had two, and here now we got four. He goes, oh, that's good. Well done. Oh, you gave me five, and now I got ten. Oh, good. Well done. Now, you notice he said, well done to both of the same people, even though neither of them had the same amount, but they had both increased it. Do you get that? So it was the increase, not the amount that mattered. It was the fact you did something with what he gave you. Right? Well, you know, I can't do what so-and-so does. So you can do with what you got. You know, it's not enough. Well, then be like the disciples when Jesus said, well, you feed them. Well, we ain't got enough to feed them with. He said, well, what are we going to feed them? He said, no, bring it to me. Well, they didn't have enough. But then when they brought it to Jesus, he broke it, blessed it, gave it back, and it multiplied in their hands. Well, I, but, you know, I don't have a gift like so-and-so. Man, I would love to be able to do that, but I don't have that gift. So, you know, well, I'd like to be able to do it. I just, I'm just not good at it. Okay, well, give it to Jesus. He'll multiply it. It'll get more, and then you can do more with it. See, okay, keep coming up with excuses. I'll keep coming up with Scripture. <laughs> because there's an answer for every excuse, Right? And so when you stand before God, you're not going to have any excuse. You're going to stand there and he's going to say, what did you do with what I gave you? What did, what did you do with my word? What did you do with my power? What did you do with my name? Because that's what, everything in here is what we see Peter doing. What is he doing? He's using that name. He said, what I got, I'm giving you. When he give it, what's he doing? He's sowing. What does that mean? It's going to reap. What does that mean? That means he's creating increase. God is looking for increase. Not amount, increase. Amen? And so nobody gets to not work. Everybody goes to work. Everybody's expected. And when he comes, now listen, he said, well done to all of these people that it had increase. And then finally this one guy says, you gave me this one and I hid it. And, but here it is. I didn't lose it. Here it is. And man, Jesus' response in in the man, in the, in the parable, doesn't fit the Jesus that everybody talks about. It doesn't fit this new age, you're okay, I'm okay, Jesus. He says, take from him what he has, give it to the one that made increase, and take him out and beat him. <laughs> doesn't, doesn't sound too good, Right? Why? He said, you're, he, what did the man tell him? Well, I know you're a hard man, and you reap where you hadn't sown, and you've done, and, and I know you're hard, and I, don't, I didn't want to lose anything, because I knew if I did, man, if I lost a dime of your money, I know you'd beat me, because you're a hard man. And notice Jesus didn't even, in the parable, Jesus, the man that Jesus talked about, didn't say, I'm not a hard man. He said, you knew I was a hard man. And that didn't push you to do what you should do. Think about that. Now, see, none of that parable fits the way we see Jesus. But we have to realize that if you, there's times when you talk to people, there's times when you can talk to a doctor or different people, and they can seem very harsh. Why? Because they're, the last thing they care about is your feelings. Why? Because your feelings will change in about 30 minutes. Just back and forth. One day, Jesus is riding into town. Everybody, oh, Hosanna. Oh, oh, this is amazing. He's wonderful, cheering and all this stuff. Less than a week later, crucify him. Crowd can change on a dime. Why? That's why you can't base anything you say or do based on the crowd. But you got people that they can seem harsh and they can seem rough. Why? It's because, let's be honest, if you're saved, it ain't about you no more. 
Why? Because you made Jesus Lord. Now it's about those out there that don't know him. Why? Because you're, you're good. So why, we, why should we spend all the rest of our days trying to placate you and make you feel good? Whenever there's people out there dying and going to hell. See, our job now, sometimes, and people, well, you know, I, he, he didn't stop and talk to me, but, you know, he said hi, wave, whatever, but he didn't stop and talk to me. So probably some pressing business. Probably somebody dying somewhere that this person has to get to, to talk to, to pray for, or minister to, or whatever it is. Well, you know, but that hurt my feelings. Well, when you're in that person's situation, that you're dying, you're going to thank them for not stopping and talking to everybody on the way. But see, you don't get that because it's about you. And it's how, you, how it makes you feel. Ministers aren't here to make you feel good. They are here to make you profitable for the kingdom of God. That's why they're here, to be profitable servants of the kingdom of God. Because the minute you made Jesus Lord, see, people, it's so amazing. People think you're joining some cool social club. You're not. You're enlisting in the army of heaven. You're enlisting. The last free will decision you made was to make Jesus Lord. After that, everything is yes, sir. You know, you might not know how to do it. It might be, how do I do that, sir? But there is never a no, sir. Why? Because he's your Lord. But see, we don't have that. Why? Because we've become this customer service-based organization that we got to keep the customers happy rather than realizing that we are an army and that the fivefold ministry is to train and equip you to grow up to be good soldiers of Jesus Christ. And then one of the first things you've got to kill in that is your emotions. And jump over that thing and say, you know what, I'm, I'm sorry, if I'm not pleasant to you right now, it's because there's some serious business. Somebody's hurting, somebody's dying, you're good, you're safe, whatever it is, that's good, but now it's about them. So everything you're taught, now understand, I'm not saying you shouldn't learn how to be blessed and walk in the blessings, but the reason you're blessed and walk in the blessings is so you can be a blessing. Not so that you can just pile it all up and be greedy. Amen. Is this making sense? You know, I don't see any handkerchiefs waving or, you know, Jericho marches or anything, you know, or any of that. But, you know, but I'm not here to entertain you. I'm here to train you and to cause you to grow up. And we've got to grow up. We've already seen what the world looks like when the church starts to back down and focus only on blessings. Why? Because, listen, the devil loves it when all you think about and talk about is trying to find the blessings that God has given you. He loves it. Why? Because you get all wrapped up in here. And it's all about you and about you getting better and you more and, oh, look how the Lord has blessed me. And while you're doing that, you're not thinking about how the world is going to hell. And so the, the devil doesn't care what you do in here. He doesn't care how loud you sing. He doesn't care who gets healed in here. All he cares about is, now he does care about what you learn in here, but even more than that, he cares about what you do with it out there. Because it's easy to be super Christian in here. But you've got to stand the same ground out there. Amen? Is this making sense to you? Now look at this, and let's see. I'm going to have to... Oh, yeah, I'm going to have to stop pretty quick anyway. So, Acts chapter 3. I just want to get to this real quick, okay? And he said he took him by the right hand, verse 7, took him by the right hand, lifted him up, and immediately his feet and ankle bones received strength. And he, the man, leaping up, whenever Peter helped him, now the strength came, bam, he's leaping up, and stood and walked and entered with them into the temple, walking and leaping and praising God. And all the people saw him walking and praising God. And they knew that it was he which sat for alms at the beautiful gate of the temple. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at that which had happened unto him. And as the lame man which was healed held Peter and John, all the people ran together unto them in the porch that is called Solomon's, greatly wondering. So this is causing a big stir now because they know this guy. And now watch this. And when Peter saw it, he answered unto the people, You men of Israel, why marvel ye at this? Or why look ye so earnestly on us? Now wait a minute. 
Just a minute ago, he told this man, look on us. Now he turns around and says, why are you looking at us? Well, why? Because the first man he was talking to, he had something for him. And now he's saying, but you're looking at us differently now. Now watch what he says. Why are you looking at us? Uh, There he is. And why look ye so earnestly on us as though by our own power or holiness we had made this man to walk? Now what does that tell us? He says, look, he said, this power that I used, it it didn't originate from me. I'm I'm not special. This power was from God. Now he had the power of God and he could freely give it, but he recognized it wasn't him doing it, that it was a God in him doing it. You got that? But now look at this other part. He said, you're looking at us as though somehow we're magic. Why are you looking at us like we're magic? Or why are you looking at us as if we're so holy? Oh, look at that. Holiness doesn't produce power. Right there. Lots of holy people, lots of good holy saints not walking in power. See, what do you think? Well, if I get clean enough, God will use me. If I can get clean, now, should you be clean? Yeah, should you live clean, walk clean? Absolutely, absolutely. But it shouldn't be a, you shouldn't use it. You ought to live clean because you have gratitude from what God delivered you from. Amen? And so, but now think about this because he says here, why are you looking at us as though by our own holiness? Oh, well, you know, we got to be holy for the gifts of the Spirit to work through us. Hang on. I beg to differ. 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Even starting, in, well, go back to 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 1 and chapter, actually, 3. In chapter 3, he says, you're still babies. You're carnal. Amen. Isn't that right? He said, as long as you talk, I'm a Paul, I'm a Paul, you're carnal, you walk as mere men. He said, and you're babies. Paul said, I wanted, to, I wanted to talk to you as in the spiritual, but I couldn't. I had to talk to you like carnal, natural people, not even like Christians. I had to talk to you like this. Why? Because you're carnal. Isn't that right? Yeah. That's in chapter 3. Now, and he says, you're carnal. And he said, I couldn't give you anything spiritual, and I still can't give you spiritual. Because you're, listen, by the time he finished the book, the letter, they didn't change. There was no change. He didn't start saying one thing and then end up talking to them like something else. He said, you're carnal. They were carnal all the way through there. But then the amazing thing is, he said, when it comes to spiritual gifts, you don't come behind anybody. Think about that. These carnal Corinthians had more spiritual gifts operating in their midst than the more spiritual Ephesians and Philippians and those guys. Think about that. Oh, well, you know, if I get spiritual and if I pray enough, if I fast enough, maybe God will use me with a gift. Not according to Paul. You don't have to be spiritual. You've got to be carnal enough. Is that what he said? He said, you've got these gifts going, and here's what they are. And he had to explain it to them because they didn't know what all was happening. Now, I'm not telling you to be carnal, but why did the gifts function so good among the carnal Corinthians? You, you know why? I can tell you. They had lack. They didn't understand. They didn't know. They didn't know how to get people healed. They didn't know how... They didn't know the wisdom of God. They didn't know the knowledge of God. So the Holy Spirit had to work in carnal people to fill up their lacking. And that's what he did with gifts operating. That's why you don't really see gifts mentioned in Jesus' life. Why? Because he wasn't lacking. He was walking in the fullness of the Spirit. He didn't didn't walk in gifts as burst of power at times. He walked in the fullness of the Spirit, and he walked in all the time. Why? Because he was a mature son. And that's what he wants us to do. And see, as you mature, I'm not saying gifts won't operate. I'm saying as you mature, you will notice them less. In other words, you won't bring attention to them. Why? Because you get your mind off of the giftings, and you get your mind on what the gifts do of helping people. And then it becomes less of a, hey, I'm operating in the gift of word of knowledge. Hey, I'm operating in the gift of healing. And you get away from that, and then all of a sudden it's like, wow, did you see how God blessed that person? You see how God answered them and healed them? You see what, how amazing God is because he did this? For them? See, why? Because you now you're not carnal. See, you're seeing past your gifting, and you're seeing how good God is of meeting the needs of other people, even if he uses you to do it. And honestly, as you use the gifts, other people might notice, but honestly, you probably wouldn't even notice. Why? Because you're too busy doing what needs to be done. Amen? All right, I'm going to finish right here. We're going to go quick. So in verse 13, 
Now notice Peter takes a chance now to start preaching. He said, why do you look on us? So by our power, holiness, we do this. He said, man, you, the God of Abraham, the Isaac, and Jacob, the God of our fathers, has glorified his son Jesus, whom you delivered up. Now, he was quick to point the finger, right? Whom you delivered up and denied him in the presence of Pilate when he was determined to let him go. But you denied the Holy One and the just and desired a murderer to be granted unto you and killed the Prince of Life, whom God has raised from the dead, whereof we are witnesses. Now look at this. Here it is, verse 16. And his name, through faith in his name, has made this man strong, whom you see and know. Yea, the faith which is by him. And now he's not talking about uh, the man here, because the man had no faith. The faith which is by him, he's talking about Jesus. The faith which comes to us by Jesus, okay? The faith which is by him, and watch this has given him this, this man, this presence, this, this perfect soundness in the presence of you all. He just answered. You know, what, you know how he did that? He said, what I got, I give you. But notice, and he used the name of Jesus. Here he said, it was not our holiness. This power is not magic. But it was the name of Jesus that made this man whole. Think about that. The name of Jesus. Now, let me ask you this, and here, here we'll close. What is this, my fourth closing, I think it is? Anyway, so. How do you get saved? How do you get saved? Is there any other name under heaven whereby we must be saved? So if you got saved, it's because you had faith in the name of Jesus. Is that right? So how many of you are saved? So you're telling me that you have faith in the name of Jesus. Is that right? Now let me get this straight. You're telling me that you have faith in the name of Jesus. And we just read that faith in the name of Jesus made that crippled man whole. So what you're telling me is you have what Peter had that can heal the sick and make the cripple whole. That, that's what you're telling me because you have faith in that name. Then it doesn't sound like there's much left to do but get busy. Making profit off of what he's given you. Amen? Amen. Father, let's pray. Let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you. We, we bless your name. Lord, we glorify you. We thank you for your son. We thank you for the ability, the privilege of using your son's name to accomplish your will. We thank you for the Holy Spirit that empowers us to bring about your will. We thank you even now, Father. We have your name. We have the name, we have the, the power, we have your word, we have your spirit, we have their giftings. Father, you've given us all things that pertain to life and godliness. That you have imparted these things to him, that, that you have blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly place. So Father, today I pray according to Ephesians chapter 1 that the eyes of their understanding may be enlightened. That they would grow in the knowledge of you, that they would know what they have in you. That they will be good and faithful stewards and servants of this treasure that you have given us in these earthen vessels. And that as we steward this, that we will produce profit for the kingdom. That our minds will be taken off of us and we will think with the mind of Christ. And that his agenda and his will be accomplished in and through us. So Father, we thank you that you have strengthened us with all might and power, that we're strong in your power, not in our own power, not in our own wisdom or strength or intelligence or anything else, but that we are vessels filled with you, filled with all the fullness of yourself. And we thank you that these vessels are committed to you and that you will fill and continue filling and continue to use and that we will grow and grow brighter and brighter into the perfect day. And Father, I thank you that now as we finish this time together that I commit and commend these, your people, to the Holy Spirit. That he will continue to lead and guide and teach and lead us and guide us into all truth 
so that we may grow up completely into your son Christ Jesus according to your will and your word in Jesus name so right now I say to you under the sound of my voice in the name of Jesus be blessed in Jesus name amen